Welcome to Behavior Groups. My name is Kurt Nelson. And I'm Tim Houlihan. We are building a community of people interested in positively applying behavioral science to their work and life. We do this by having fun and engaging conversations with a wide variety of people. In this episode, we are continuing our series with Carnegie Mellon researchers and sharing a conversation we recorded in an alcove in Porter Hall with Professor Russell Goldman. Russell is an Associate Professor of Behavioral Economics and Decision Sciences in the Social and Decision Sciences Department at CMU. Russell came to his interdisciplinary group with a PhD in mathematics, and his pioneering work has been published in a wide range of academic journals. In 2017, Russell organized the Belief-Based Utility Conference at Carnegie Mellon and regularly collaborates with his fellow researchers within the department. Russell has, uh, for some time, been curious about bounded rationality and about how human beings don't always behave the way economists predict we will. We talked with him about how we care very deeply about being consistent with our beliefs. Well, at least some of our beliefs. (laughs) Okay, some of our beliefs. To the point where we'll make irrational decisions to remain consistent. This leads to information avoidance, which is when we anticipate bad news on something that is important to us, like our health, and we intentionally ignore it. The second big topic we discussed was when people are curious, they'll go to great lengths to get information that they want. And while you could probably say that both of these observations are intuitive, Russell is very interested in the solutions, like how we can help people not avoid going to the doctor simply because they don't want to hear bad news. With this mindset, Russell joined the Social and Decision Sciences Department at CMU in 2012, the place where Herb Simon first conceived of the concept of bounded rationality roughly 60 years ago. In our grooving session, Tim and I discussed both of these big topics, information avoidance and curiosity. And specifically, we talk about how we can apply these principles into our work. So sit back, enjoy another episode in our Carnegie Mellon series with a conversation with Professor Russell Goldman. Welcome, Russell Goldman, to the Behavioral Groups Podcast. Happy to be here. Glad to have you here. We'd like to start with a little speed round with unicycle or bicycle? Bicycle. Coffee or tea? Tea. Travel with no itinerary or a set itinerary? Changing itinerary. Changing itinerary. Changing I itinerary. Like oh, that. interesting. I, I, okay. I can't get, get stuck in this forced choices here. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently not. All right. Michelangelo or Monet? Uh, Monet. All right. Okay. There we go. Okay, great. Well, good. So uh, your work uh, is, is broad and, and varied, right? But we would like for you, if you would, share a little bit about information avoidance. Talk about sort of the, a big picture story about information avoidance and some of the things that you've discovered uh, in, in some of that work. Yeah, I, I got in, very interested in the fact that people tend to not want lots of pieces of information that would be very useful to them. Um, so... Um, Economists usually think that information can only help you make better decisions. Like, why would you not want to know something and then find that, like, you could have made a better decision if you knew? And then you look around and ordinary people just, there's lots of things they don't want to know. So people, they're eating dessert. You say, like, do you want to know how many calories are in that piece of chocolate cake? People don't want to know that. I don't want to know. <laughs> I'm, count me in on that one. <laughs> yeah. Um, you ask people, do you want to know, you know what might be causing that, that symptom you have? Like you're, you've, got, um, you've got some swelling there. Should you get it checked out? You've got a lump. Should you get it checked out? People are like, maybe it'll go away. I don't want to know. Right? If, yeah. it, if, if it reaches a point where it's like impacting their lives, maybe they need to deal with it. Um, it'd probably be wise to get it checked out before it impacts your life. But a lot of people say, I don't want to go to the doctor. I don't want to know that. And and so what have you been finding with this information of one? So what is your research kind of pointing to and what are you looking at? What are you trying to discover? Uh, my research is trying to figure out why do people avoid information? So okay. there's, there's a lot of this empirical research that documents that people do avoid information that would be useful. I mean, I do some uh, theoretical modeling that tries to say, can we, can we put this in a framework where we understand why this happens? Okay. Um, and the, the pieces of the framework that I focus on are belief-based utility, okay. so that, that people care about their beliefs, not just for the decisions they, they make based on these beliefs, but just 
certain beliefs are nice to have and other beliefs are not nice to have. So thinking that my dessert is really unhealthy, it's not a nice belief. And <laughs> thinking that I'm about to be sick um, or that I might have a serious disease, that's not a nice belief. Um, and then there, you need something more than just not liking certain beliefs because in principle it seems like even before you get the before you decide not to get the information, you must already have some fear of this bad outcome. It's like, didn't you already suspect that you had this this bad thing going on that you didn't want to believe? So, like, how does getting the information make it worse? Yeah. And what we think is going on is attention. That it's like you get the information and it forces you to pay attention to it. Interesting. Oh, and and to your point, when you talk about some of the. Uh, information avoidance with you know disease, different things, and I, I had an, an aunt who um, literally you know went into the hospital and died a few few days later from some stuff. And what we found out later is she had lots of symptoms going into this many months, many 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 months in advance. But she just chose not to get it checked out and different things. And so what you're saying is that there's this element of a belief utility that she's probably going, yeah, I kind of know something, but I really don't want to know that. Yeah, I I don't want to know it and I don't want to have to think about it. So like if I go to the doctor, I can't not think about about what could be wrong. If I go about my daily business, then it's just not top of mind. And so it doesn't bother me as much when it's not top of mind. Does this fit into a broader story of our desire to just avoid, avoid things in general? Uh, yep. Avoid unpleasant experiences. Oh. Avoid. I'm thinking of you know of just any kind of. Uh, I don't like to uh, cold call, so I'm not going to be a sales rep. You know, so just you know, I'm just going to push that off and just not do that. Is this is is uh, information avoidance part of a, a larger narrative? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, generally people try to avoid uncomfortable situations, right? And and there's nothing that's irrational about trying to avoid a bad outcome. So <laughs> yeah, right. so so I mean that just. It's totally normal. The the odd thing about avoiding information is it seems like even if you don't get the information, like the bad state of the world is still there. It's like even if I don't find out that I'm sick, I might still be sick. Right. Right. And so the thing that you need to wrap your head around is it's not just like the physical consequences of being sick that are bad, but the the knowing that you're sick is itself bad. The it's like, knowledge like, like the finding out about it is yeah, what's bad also on, yeah. on top of the actual being sick. So what is some of the research that you're doing on this? So help us understand like specifically how are you going and, and identifying these and then figuring out what's going on. So, um, so, so what I do is I, I build theoretical models okay. right? and, and, um, there's been existing models that say that like people care about their beliefs, they care about anticipatory utility, they might have anxiety if, they, um, if they're afraid of something bad happening. And then um, there's some debate then, which is like, does this really explain, explain the patterns? Okay. Um, so if you, if you have the anticip- anticipatory utility, but you don't have this kind of intentional component, it seems like... You might you might be happy with information. You might be unhappy with information, depending on um, just like like do you like um, do you like finding things out in general? Okay. But these models don't don't tell you why why would you not want information about these negative things and still want information about positive things? Okay. Um, and so um, the research that I've done is is try to create a model that the model sort of tells a story about why do we avoid information about certain things and not about other things. Okay. It's not like we avoid all kinds of information. It's like, yeah. if you were to give me a gift here, I wouldn't be like, I don't want to open it and find out what it is. <laughs> That's information I'd be very comfortable getting. Right. Um, so are, are there particular categories that we, that we have this co- a, a more normalized or common level of avoidance? I think it does tend to be unpleasant things. It's like it's like we avoid anything unpleasant. Avoid anything unpleasant, or avoid information about anything unpleasant. Yeah, because because this is really focused on the information side. It's not actually trying to avoid the it's experience. Not, yep. Because as you said, that's inevitable. Yep. <laughs> right to a large degree. Yep. And in fact, getting the information is is maybe even helpful in avoiding the negative experience. Right. If you find out you're sick, you can get the doctor to treat it. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, before yeah. before it becomes right. so so horrible that there's no longer any kind of cure for it or any kind of, of prognosis. So, I'm thinking yep. about uh, uh, Lori Santos at, at Yale. Her, her, she's got the GI Joe. Um, uh, effects. Fallacy. Yeah, this this fallacy that you know where GI Joe would end his his uh, TV show by saying, and uh, now that you know, knowing is half the battle, and <laughs> and that's a big problem because we don't even want to know in some cases. It sounds like yeah, and, and so you've got like the government tries to come in and tell people all sorts of things that they think would be good for them to know, like calorie labeling. Yeah. Um, it would be good for them to know they'd make better decisions, but people don't want to know that. Um, the calorie labeling doesn't really work um, because people don't want to know how many calories are in their, their dessert or in their Big Mac. Wow. I, I was using it today, <laughs> uh, this morning at breakfast, actually. I was fully aware of it. So. And, and did it make a ma- did it, did it make a difference? Because I, I noticed you picked one of the higher calorie oh God, components. So you were watching, too. I, I did. I, I picked the nice low-calorie fruit did. basket. You did. Or, yes. You know, there um, you go. I, I did. I, I mean, I certainly like having the calorie information available to me, but, but I think most people, they, they don't want to know. Or they, I think there can be some like backfiring there also. So you can have people who mm. say like, I want to make sure I get my money's worth. I want to make sure that I'm not still hungry after, after I order this meal. So I got to get something that's high enough calories. You can imagine somebody says, I'm going to make sure to get something really big. I don't have to finish it. And then once they get it, they're probably going to finish it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, like like the studies on uh, if you, you whether you get a, a medium size or a large size popcorn, you'll probably eat about the same percentage of the popcorn. Yeah, you just, you just eat more. Well, and it was we had a conversation yesterday um, in regards to just this same thing of of calorie information and the component of you know we we may get some some of that information, oh, I was really good on, you know, not ordering the burger and I ordered, you know, something else, but then you feel justified. I didn't get cheese on the burger. Yeah, so now I feel justified in getting, you know, the ice cream sundae at the end. And so overall calories are are much bigger and different things. I mean, there's a lot of components that come into all of these these elements. So so help us then as you're thinking through like this information avoidance component. Um, So... With your findings, then how does how how do people apply this? How is this being? What what are some of the, the ways that this could be used by you know, maybe not our listeners, but in, in policy components or other things that that are moving forward? What do you what do you hope to gain from knowing this information? I mean, a big picture is we'd like people to get medical attention before things get serious. Yeah. Um, so we do think that like these pieces of information that. The government wants to distribute, or that policymakers might want people to know. These are these are worthwhile goals. Like you think you want to encourage people to get testing for for sexually transmitted infections or something. Yes. Um, so we think getting the information actually is worth it. Um, we don't want to dismiss the concerns people have, the reasons why they avoid the information. But I might think that people tend to be focused on the present. They think that finding out the bad news is going to be so horrible. And they maybe forget that they're going to adapt to it and it's not going to be the end of their life. Um, But in fact, they're going to get used to whatever bad news they get. And then if they can um, take some some actions going forward, they they can be fine with it and actually be better off. Great. Um, But then because the reason people are avoiding the information isn't just like a mistake, but it's because they really have these deep feelings about getting the information. It's very hard to design programs where you actually will get people to be receptive of what you want to tell them. So... Like, I don't have the solution of how do you get people to, to get tested. Um, but I think that understanding the resistance to why they're not getting tested is the first part of trying to come up well, with a good policy. Yeah, that's right. Great. Uh, so you said that uh, before, we, before we went live, you're working more towards curiosity. Yeah. You're kind of moving from information avoidance more toward curiosity. Can you tell the listeners a little bit about some of the work you're doing in curiosity? Yeah, curiosity is sort of the antidote to information avoidance. Okay, fair um, enough. I'm and, curious uh, about this. Yeah. 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 Right. I'm curious. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, and I actually initially had an interest in curiosity, which is what got me interested in information avoidance in the first place. And now I'm sort of, <laughs> I've researched it in the other direction a little bit. But it, it's, it's just um, not... 
not ironic enough that curiosity <laughs> would actually lead you to information avoidance. Yeah. That's well, it's like, it's like, you know, what are the bounds on curiosity? It was one of the first things I was thinking about. And then how can we understand these situations where people aren't curious? Right. right. So, so I, I eventually sort of came back to the, then thinking about how can we relate these two things together? And so I mentioned uh, attention being a big part of what I think is the story of information avoidance. People don't want to pay attention to these beliefs that they're very uncomfortable with. Right. I think the flip side is that when people are paying attention to what they don't know, that often makes them very curious. Um, and so uh, like attention to, to these questions that you have that you don't have answers for, George Lowenstein and I call them information gaps. Attention to these information gaps makes you curious. I mean, so... Um, we've, we've got this theory that allows for both curiosity and information avoidance, and we've got some nice e experimental tests of some of these predictions about curiosity. Oh, um, well, uh, share, share yeah, this. So, so um, we think, what are the ways that you can get people to pay attention to information gaps? So one thing you could do is you could just make it salient. Like you could bring it up in conversation. Um, you could prime somebody to think about it. Or in the flip side, if you want to make something less salient, you could just let some time go by after you had um, raised the issue. So we give subjects a test to take. It's like, can they identify um, emotions based on just a little small um, cropped picture of people's faces? So you get to see just their eyes. Can you figure out their emotions just from seeing their eyes? And we think that people may be somewhat curious about like, how good are they at reading faces like this. Um, and so we give them a chance to find out the, how well they do on this test. Compared it, to? In one case, they get to find out right after they took the test. In another case, a whole day goes by before they get the chance to find out. So a whole day goes by, you're not so curious anymore. It's not salient anymore. Um, ah. another, another thing that we think can affect curiosity is just how important um, this question that you're asking yourself is. Yeah. And of course... In, Information can be important for a lot of reasons. It could be important because you'd use it, and that's not particularly surprising if, if that's why you're getting the information. But it could also just like feel important, um, even if it doesn't have any usefulness to you. So we give people um, a series of trivia questions, and we set it up so that they, they can get a bonus if they get all the trivia questions correct. Um, and eventually, we're going to ask them, how curious are they for this last trivia question, which is really hard. Um, and so most of them aren't getting it correct, and they're going to see, are they curious about it? But in one case, all the questions before it were pretty hard. So by the time they get to the last one, they didn't really have a chance with the bonus anyway. They weren't going to get them all correct. In the other case, the initial questions were all easy, and then they get this one hard one, and that's really the difference between getting the bonus or not. Now it's too late. They didn't get the bonus, but are they curious? If this was the difference between getting the bonus or not, it felt really important to them, and now they're much more curious. Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I think that, that's a fascinating experimental model well, uh, it, it, to, it, to get to that. It, it reminds me of the component, and, and I forget what the it, it's called, but it's the missing an airline flight by one minute and how upset you are versus, you know, my I got stuck in traffic and I'm 40 minutes late. Yeah, you still miss the airline flight. Yep. But the level of your, you know, it, it, vividness or whatever like it how is, important how, how important it? that yep. is. And like, oh, if and you kind of go back in your head, if I would have only done this. Yeah, so, it, so we thought a lot about, like, how do we think of importance? We've got, like, a, a, a formal definition in our paper. Um, but we thought about, like, counterfactual thinking. Like, yeah. One thing is that, when something is in the future, there's all this uncertainty about how it's going to go. And so uncertainty can make something feel important because there's a lot of different ways they could go. Some can be good, some can be bad. Once something's in the past, then it's already happened and it no longer feels very important because it's like the only way it could have gone is the way it went. And so that's just how it was. Like it's not important because there's no other way it could have gone. Right. So counterfactual thinking, you're sort of forced to think about how else it could have gone. But it, it's not so natural for people to think about how else the past could have gone. It sort of went how it went and That's it feels it, inevitable, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, and then other things that affect importance are just like self-relevancy. So um, if something feels like it's, it really is about you, it's just going to feel a lot more important than if it's about some stranger. So, so in, in the context of, you know, as an antidote to information avoidance, I read um, a newspaper article and I, I, I don't know the source here. I don't know for sure if it's true. They were claiming that President Trump wasn't reading his... Um, his presidential security briefings. Okay. Um, and so I can't speak to whether this is true or not, but what they said was that the, the um, national security team that was writing the briefings 
took to placing his name as many times in the briefing as possible to try to get his attention. Okay. So to me, this is exactly like trying to make something seem important. We're just going to throw your name out there a bunch of times. It's going to seem <laughs> self-relevant and <laughs> might great. make you curious about it. So, so they the, got the, the right idea. So they got whether or not it's true, <laughs> whether that's true, if they were doing it, it would be it would be a, it's a good, good thing based good on the, the information and the research that you, you know of. So yep, it, it's a good strategy, I think. It's a good strategy. <laughs> Very interesting. I, I, I want to go back to this idea of uh, thinking about the future, which is uncertain, and so things become more important as we're framing them as future decisions, and the past is less important because, well, it's just done. You know, that seems to, to kind of focus on the results, right, on whatever the outcome was rather than the process or the the process of either decision making or the or the process of getting to wherever we were, um, it is our natural tendency, right, just to focus on the result. If the if if the result is unknown and I can't easily predict it, well, that then that becomes more important to me. Um, le- even avoiding or skipping over how important the process of getting into the future is. Uh, just thinking about the result. I'm editorializing and uh, thinking about other conversations that we've had. So, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I'm, I'm a big sports fan, and so so you notice this in in scouting, where um, like if a if a player turns out to be a great player, they, they're looking at the result, like you know, did I predict this? Yeah. They're not thinking about the process of like, should we have expected a certain draft pick to actually turn out well? What could we expect? Um, so, in, in thinking about how can you make better decisions, I think it's it's clearly the case that focusing on process. Um, is a better metric for what's something a good decision than focusing on outcome. Um, but it's not intuitive to people to do that. Well, and I, I think that's a great component. And you kind of think about all of the other factors that have, of that happening too, right? And, and even like the coach's decision to do these plays, if it results in a first down or it results in a touchdown, yeah, that was the right one versus not. And even if you look back and say, well, yeah, 80% of the time that worked and this was yeah. just that 20% that it didn't and now it's a bad decision versus good you know yeah. all of that that's a I, whole I, a few years ago the Seahawks had an interception at the one yard line it's yeah. easy to look at the outcome but is it a bad process I'm, I'm not I don't have the expertise to judge that, but I won't assume it was a bad process just because they maybe had some bad luck. Just because the outcome wasn't what all the fans wanted or what anyone wanted, I suppose. Well, the the Patriots wanted it. Well, the Patriots (laughs) wanted it, but the Seahawks did not want it. (laughs) Well, Annie Duke talked about it. We talked with Annie Duke, and she wrote about that in her book, and Thinking Bets. But she said, you know, they they did some research afterwards, and then of the 70 some plays, and I'm going to get me wrong on the numbers, right? That year that were a pass from the two yard line or less. There were no interceptions. Um, there's like 60% completion and 40% dropped. And so if you actually look at that, you're going, well, yeah, that was a second down play. They would get a component where, you know, they either would get an extra play out of it because now they don't have to run the timeout. There's 20 seconds on the clock. Yep. And the likelihood is either it's going to be caught for a, comp- for a touchdown or it's an incomplete, which then gets an extra play. So yeah, the decision to do that, great. The outcome not so great for for the Seahawks, and so you look at that, and it's it's a really interesting component in thinking through that. But we digress. But yes, we, we yes. go down <laughs> rabbit holes all the time. Yes, we I, I want to go back to the importance because you talked about the self relevance, and and I do a fair amount of work with organizations around their incentive plans, and we always get this component of people uh, of the organization saying, look, we don't have to put a lot of effort into how we communicate an incentive plan because people are really curious about their own pay. Mm -hmm. And there's a component of that that I believe in, but I also have this component, the belief that we need to make that information as saleable, as easy to understand, as actionable to so that people, you know, don't have to read through say five pages of of statistics and text to to understand how they get paid. I don't know if you have any component of is there work that says, yeah, I'm I'm curious up to a point, but if there's so much work going into like trying to figure out how I get paid, even though it's really relevant to me, that I just make some heuristic components and don't really 
get into the details, but I just make some generalizations and then uh, now my curiosity is, is solved. And that's pretty specific. I don't know if, if there's anything that you would be able to pull out from that. Well, we certainly do think that the cost of getting some information matters. And okay. it, it could be a monetary cost, but it could also be an effort cost. Um, so, so, you know, when I was describing our curiosity studies before, I just said people were more curious. But if you really pushed me, you could say, well, how did I know they were more curious? What was my dependent variable here? Right. And so we didn't just ask them, you know, on a survey, how curious are you? <laughs> Instead, in one of these studies, we, we said, well, you're going to need to click this button if you want more information. That doesn't seem like any cost. That just seems that's free, right? But then they click the button and we told them, click it again if you want the information. They click it again and we told them, click it again if you want the information. So this begins to feel pretty annoying to them. Yeah. And so the question is, how many times do they keep clicking to actually <laughs> find out? You're um, adding a lot. You could add a lot of friction. Yeah. So, so that's exactly what we're doing is we're intentionally adding friction to find this information out to see like what kind of effort cost are they willing to go through? Three clicks, they, five clicks, yeah, eventually, 20 clicks. Eventually, if, if they clicked it 10 times, that's when they got it. But we didn't tell them 10. They, to them, they just think, like, is this thing broken? Like, this is annoying. So yeah. how many? Um, people gave up what what um, and, and well, where where do they give up yeah i i i'd say it's a mix um i think about half the people when in the condition where we were getting um a lot of curiosity about half the people clicked straight through all 10 okay. times um and then you get some clicking earlier just they, they might give up at any point in time yeah um but yep. you did find that if they were less curious about it, that they... they it, then they didn't do as many clicks. Right. And so, yep. yeah, yeah, that's the dependent variable. So, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's very cool. Yep. Um, uh, let's, uh, let's turn over uh, to a musical leaf, if, if sure. we could, for just a minute. <laughs> uh, what? Why are you, are you going music? Can we, can we are you, did you have... No, go music. You a, always go music. I'll be curious about what musical question you're asking. Well, uh, <laughs> you, uh, Russell, you, you like bluegrass, right? Yeah, you like I, jam bands. I, I'm, I'm a big fan of jam bands. Are, yeah. you, a, are you a big concert goer? Um, I, I was a Maybe concert goer when I was a bit kids. younger, before having kids. Okay, <laughs> okay. Uh, great concert experiences that you, uh, that come to mind, vivid, wonderful um, my favorite concert experience has been going to the Great Blue Heron Music Festival in upstate New York. It's only about a two and a half hour drive here from Pittsburgh. Um, it's a small music festival. It's not, it's not huge. Very friendly community, friendly people. Um, the headliner every year is a band called Donna the Buffalo. Donna the Buffalo headlines every year. Every year, yep. It's like their festival. <laughs> That's what it sounds like. Yep. Yeah. It's good. That's a hell of a good gig. Yep. <laughs> Uh, okay, so uh, what makes it vivid for you? Um, they, they've got a couple of different um, uh, performance stages. They just have everybody sort of dancing and enjoying themselves. And um, uh, some years we've been there and it's been super rainy and you'll get like a good layer of mud on the ground in front of the tent. Um, and so we've taken to calling it the Mudfoot Festival. No, oh, there you go. <laughs> uh-huh, uh-huh. Yep. Uh -huh. um, I can I can also remember a few of the the characters from the festival. Um, uh, I've seen a guy using a watermelon rind as a hat there, and that's pretty memorable. <laughs> <laughs> that is memorable. <laughs> wow. Uh, are you introducing Donna the Buffalo to your kids? Oh yes, yes. We we, we have little uh, d dance parties in the living room, and uh, got to get them listen to our music instead of being forced to play Baby Shark for the hundredth time. <laughs> <laughs> I am so glad my kids did not. Or they're they're above the age of baby shark because i have just heard so many people that it's just it's that yeah component of, is baby shark just a earworm central or what what is it about them that the, the baby shark thing that's just i haven't heard it oh uh, we're gonna have to have a link in the show so, notes i think yeah so, so so there's like hand motions that go with it um there's there's the grandpa shark that doesn't have teeth um, so there's there's like a, the whole the whole story here, and the kids just get into doing the hand motions. The music is catchy. I mean, it's it's not bad the first time you hear it, but after a hundred times, the kids keep going, and I want something else. <laughs> yeah, as as we talked with Jeff Gaelic yesterday yeah, about yeah. hedonic discounting, and you know, and and this whole component, we talked about music and that very fact of simple uh, a simpler tune is easy to catch on to, but it's also quicker to fade. Yeah, uh, yeah. Know. So so part of like in jam bands is they often sort of 
of go on in like new directions with their music. And so, so you might catch a song that you've heard before, but have them play it in a different way. So the complexity adds to, uh, to the desire to stay involved, yep. stay interested in it. Yep. Yeah. That, that's pretty terrific. Very good. I don't have a music question. You're looking at me like I should yeah, have a music not? question. You I am not the music guy. You know this. So You love jam bands. You grew up on jam bands. Your whole life has been about jam. Oh, Dude. no, that's somebody else. Yeah, sorry. sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm like looking at you very curiously going, no, that sorry. information is wrong. I don't know where you got that. So, Russell, thank you. This has been very um, informative. I'm just uh, fascinated to see where this goes. So It was my be. pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Welcome to our grooving session, where Tim and I groove on what we learned from our Behavior Groups interview, have a free-flowing discussion on some of those topics, and whatever else comes into our information-avoiding minds. It was all about information avoidance for me. Yeah? It was totally. I just, I, well, there were actually, that was the main thing, but I also loved the curiosity clicking yeah. test. Yeah. So what, what, what struck, what do you want to talk about? I was just avoiding all, all thinking, so... <laughs> So I'm avoiding it all, man. You're not even there. I'm just a, yeah. out of my Total mind. Total avoidance. <laughs> Total avoidance on this. No, the information avoidance was, was fascinating because you think about this, again, classical economics will state that, hey, information, if, if as long as it's free and useful, we should be going for that. That should be... Consume the, it. Yeah. We should consume it. We should take it. We should... Has high utility. It. Has mm-hmm. high utility, right? I mean, going to a doctor to find out, hey, I have... I, so today I had a, a rotary meeting this morning and, and a woman was talking about her husband who had been out of breath, like climbing upstairs over the, the course of this last you know number of months. And they finally went... Months? In, yeah. They finally wow. went into, into the doctor... And he had a you know ninety five percent blockage of his one of his main arteries you know the the different things so he had a stent put in probably saved his life but you know there's a part of that that could have been you know that avoidance of saying oh there might be something wrong with me now I don't think that was the case but it could have been right and and the fact of the matter is that could save your life so are you going to avoid information that ultimately might save your life. I mean, that seems really stupid. But we do. But we do. We do all the time. Because it's scary. I don't want to go into the doctor and find out that I have cancer or that I have this and right. different things. I'd much rather just live in my la-la land, you know? Well, and we do it at work too, right? Yes. You know, like uh, managers are constantly wanting to avoid those difficult situations with difficult conversations, negative feedback, things, things like that. That gets to be problematic where the manager just doesn't want to have it. So then it, it makes it even bigger, makes it even a bigger deal. Right. So I have some negative or, or some feedback, critical feedback that I have to give to an employee. That's unpleasant, right? That is, is an unpleasant component. Nobody likes to hear that. But even more importantly, nobody really likes to give that. Or most people don't. I suppose you might. But, you know. Because <laughs> you know I'm such an asshole. Yeah, because <laughs> you, you tell me all the time, man, Kurt, you sucked. <laughs> well, it's, but that's just to let you know. That's just. <laughs> I mean, no, I think you just. <laughs> like seeing my, my cringing face going, oh, I'm sorry, man. So No, but there is that element of avoidance because we are, have to give that information out. And, and that's, right. we want to avoid that. And, and as you said, it exaggerates problems, right? It makes them worse because now you are not conveying things that are important that are potentially changing that person and the behavior and whatever. Else oh, well, and this could, this may not be just employees. This could be with clients too, right? Well, I have that. Oh, I mean, I will, and it's no fun to have that difficult conversation with things got really screwed up. And guess what? We have to have a tough conversation about it. And you know, who, what consultant wants to have that with their clients? Right. I, but in the end, I mean, I, I, have had those situations. I mean, rarely, right? Oh, no, uh, yeah. almost never, right? <laughs> almost pretty, never. Uh, pretty much every every <laughs> every time, right? But but there is this element, and and you learn that over that actually getting that conversation over with lends itself to moving on and not having those negative feelings yourself, right? That angst right. that you have of, oh my gosh, how are they going to respond to different things? There's actually this component of finality that we've had the conversation, we've discussed what is going wrong, and now we can move forward from that. And, and that's actually a really good component, but yet there's still that element of 
the angst that does come up before you have to say something. Yeah. And and so you do try to avoid it and you try to do workarounds and other things that you can. And, and those are, those aren't necessarily the best ways of doing that. <laughs> no, no. Well, okay, so what can we do? What, what would be a good way of approaching the, I've got an unpleasant task ahead of me and I don't, I don't, I don't want to do it. Let, let's use work as, as an environment here for this. Let's think about how do we frame the component, right? So how do we frame this unpleasant conversation or okay, so, yeah, let's gathering see. this unpleasant information? And so okay. now, instead of framing it and in, in thinking about the unpleasantness of this, framing it as a component of, you know, what what is the meaning? What, or what, what can we do that has a meaningful component within it? So again, to your point of that manager having that conversation with his or her employee. Mm-hmm difficult conversation, all those different things, instead of focusing in on the unpleasantness of the angst and the trepidation that you have as part of that conversation, reform it on the the meaningful aspect of, I'm helping this person improve, I'm helping our team, our organization be be better. Yeah. And when you reframe it in that situation, that takes some things away. So You, you, you might even, even be... Uh doing your own job better by by having that and you might be growing in your own career more effectively by having that conversation yeah um, you know I've had to fire many people over the years and all to you know virtually every single one that I that I had to let go was actually pretty damn un, unhappy in their jobs and yeah. they were unhappy because they really weren't well suited for them for those jobs yeah. and and uh, for whatever lack of ability to find another opportunity for them that was better matched to their capabilities I had to let them go and it was really unpleasant to do it but I also felt that there was something virtuous about giving them the opportunity to go and find something else right and to uh, many of those people, you know, I, I stayed in. T- I have stayed in touch with. I have good relationships with. I wrote, you know, reviews for them that were positive about the good things that they did. Yeah. But they just weren't a good fit in that job, and they weren't being effective, and had to have that conversation. And so I felt like it was a, you know, I could see something virtuous in in, in letting them go. Yeah. So. Uh- We've been talking more about not necessarily information avoidance. We've been talking no. about difficult conversation avoidance and different things. But I think <laughs> you, taking a look at this from the perspective of work again, we do often avoid information that could be negative. For instance, right. looking at our financials and realizing that our margins are decreasing because so they're going to feel over and over a period of time. And we don't want to realize that, right? Or the cash flow isn't there and in many entrepreneurial components. I mean, the yeah. number one reason that small businesses fail isn't because they're not profitable. It's because they don't have cash flow in order to pay their bills right. and, and everything else. And so, or, or, or looking at the download report. Or looking at the download <laughs> <laughs> and saying, wow, <laughs> we have just been amazing at the, at the, at the growth trajectory, right? Or, or we're down 22%. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but... Uh, or or, no. <laughs> or avoiding you know the the feedback like for instance on on the podcast right and so we look at the reviews and various different things and do we only look at the five star reviews or do we look at the one four star review that we have you know yeah what the hell <laughs> <laughs> but but there are those components too i mean so if you do have that customer feedback right do you only focus in on the positive and not and really avoid looking at those one star reviews or or fe- hearing that type of information because there's, it's painful to do that. And yet we know that there's probably gems of information about why or, or ways that you can improve. And so yeah. you have to get through that, that, that component. It's hearing the customer complaints. It's hearing those different types of things. It's looking at the financials. It's, it's listening to your employees when they're bringing up information that, hey, maybe the workload is way too much. And as opposed to just digging, you know, putting your blinders on Absolutely. and saying, well, we just have Absolutely. to do it, you know, listen to them and, and, and explore that a little bit more. Well, the, paying attention to critical information is, is terribly important in running our business. But as Lori Santos would say, you know, with the G.I. Joe fallacy, not you know, information in itself isn't enough. You know, we still have to act on it. Right. Uh, so, 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 what do you think? How how do we get people to act on to to actually? All right, I, I know I should, 
but now how do I actually actively go and, and, and look for this information and not avoid it? Well, Sara Bargava talked about uh, paying uh, participants, rewarding them with a $10 gift card to go and, sign, and check their balance in the 401k. They were avoiding it. Yeah. And, and that, that $10 gift card to check their balance actually caused people to, to look at their balance and realize, holy hell, I'm not signed up. Yeah. So I better sign up. And, and, uh, and, and they took some action uh, because of that. So an extrinsic reward of some sort to, to do the, the unpleasant activity. Yeah. Extrinsic rewards, I think in this situation are good for a one-time thing. I wouldn't recommend uh, extrinsic r- rewards or motivation for something that you want done on a regular basis. Agreed. Um, not, you know, not, not a good model. You could also, uh, you know, you could reward yourself just by doing something pleasant after the unpleasant thing Just say, okay, when I get done with this unpleasant thing, when I finish, you know, with the unpleasant conversation, then I'm going to go take a walk, or okay. I'm going to spend five minutes of listening to music on my headphones. You know, in, in a conference room, nobody around. You oh. know, I'm just going to reward myself. So, like when I get ice cream after these that we I do with you, <laughs> right? That's my little reward for myself, and I go, yeah. Got it. I, I get it. There is you that, go. Is that why you always have ice cream after we do one of these? <laughs> I didn't know that. I, so now. Oh, oh man, oh, I know. This I is know. just, this is like uh, too much information. <laughs> All right. So we wanted also to talk, you, you talked about curiosity at the beginning and saying that the curiosity stuff was fascinating. What fascinated you about well, that? The clicking thing, how many times someone would click, you know, relevant to, you know, how important it was, how self-relevant the the, the information was. Was, but I just, you know, I was trying to put myself in, in, in the mindset when Russell was talking about, so, you know, some people, you know, almost half of them clicked all the way through. They clicked 10 clicks just to, you have to click again. You know, are you sure you want this? You know, and I don't know. I don't know if, if I would do that. You know, I, it's hard for me to imagine I really want that information that much. Right. And yet I spend hours, you know, searching for papers and documents and substantial, you know, things that substantiate a particular perspective on the internet. So maybe in some ways I am, maybe I am doing it. I don't know. But you, (laughs) how about you? You do this too? Well, I think we all do, right? There's that component of clicking through, particularly on the internet, right? It's, it's relatively easy and yet there's a cost and there's a time frame. Yeah, and there is things. a cost. But there's also that dopamine release of like, ooh, what's, what, what's next? Uh, there, there could be something cool if like, oh, one more click, I one love, more click. I you love know? my dopamine. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I, I, I go back and, and when he started talking about that, I remember I used to have this app on my phone I can't remember what it's called. I think it was like, don't press this or something. And it was this, just this red button and you press the red button and then a little note comes up afterwards, right? And it says like, why'd you press this? Don't press it again. And so you press it again, then a different note comes up and you keep going on and finally they get, you know, it's like, if you press this again, you're going to, you know, drop a nuclear bomb on the world. And then you press it again, and okay, so we lied, but really this time it's going to be horrible, you know. And so you just keep doing. And, and was there ever a, re- a reward at the end? No, it just kept going and going and going. So, but it was well, the reward was the cute little funny little statement, right? And after so you, every one, after every one, uh-huh. and I think actually there was a point where it's just you know there was just like the same thing, you know, kept coming up a, a few times. And then yeah. if I, I thought that would bore you, you know, <laughs> you're still doing this in different pieces. But well, I heard Jim Gaffigan recently say that he's addicted to the news. Okay. And that really resonated with me because that is, that is my dopamine release. And I'm, and my curiosity is, well, what's the next story? What's the next story? What's the next story? What's the next story? What's the, what's the next story? It's like, oh my God, I just like, I, I got to stop. See, that's my information avoidance sometimes. <laughs> really? Well, think about, yeah. I mean, think about the news today, right? A vast majority of the news out there is is pretty negative. It's pretty downtrodden. And it makes me feel, oh, I, I, I lose hope in humanity uh, when, I, <laughs> no, when I hear the news no. and I hear what's going on and some of the, the crazy shit that's going down. And so I just want to avoid it. And mm-hmm. in reality, though, it's really important for me to understand that, to be an active participant in society. I should be looking at that and I should be searching it out. But I do actively just avoid some of that. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Um, uh, I want to go to a musical question here for you. What am I going to avoid from my music? No, what? no. On the curiosity side. Okay. You, how do you find new music? No. Okay. So we've, I think we've talked a little bit about this in the past. Yeah, but I think there... But, but in this context of in this, curiosity... 
So in this context of curiosity, I think there is uh, listening to the radio. So it's 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 pre-programmed for me, right? The I listen to stations that provide a a mix of newer, you know, or different music. And well, so, music that's curated to something that you think you would like, right? Right. So, so you're, you're not listening. locally. Locally, I listen to the current. Usually, I listen to, to yeah. the you know the what is it the alt ninety three point three. You know, again to to my genres, but they are playing newer music. The current, and it in fact though plays a wide variety of different musical styles. Sometimes they is, play music prior to nineteen seventy eight. They do. It's yeah. really. I mean, I hear some Jimi <laughs> Hendrix. You know. Yes. And some others that that you talk about, but with that, I think then you know to actively do it. I think there are some times where I will just on um, because the the uh, threshold, the friction threshold of of searching for new music. I don't have to go out and buy. Uh, a CD or an album anymore and not know if I'm going to like it or not, I can just go to Spotify or Pandora and stream it and I can, you know, test something out. So I think there's a lot more of that happening, particularly in some of those, those components where I'm listening to something on that and I hear a band that I hadn't heard of before and I might click through and say, oh, like, Ooh, Floor Cash, and now I can Floor Cash Radio, and so now I have some more of their stuff and various different things. So you're, uh, you could also frame this in a way that says you're you're not listening to or you're avoiding, like you're not listening to the classical music station, right? <laughs> That's true. Right? I am you're, avoiding. You're not listening to the mainstream country station or the traditional country station or the folk roots station or right, right? right. or the reggae station. Right. Do we have a reggae station in the Twin Cities? Well, I, don't, I don't think we do. Actually, I just made that up. But <laughs> but you could be listening to I it. Could, I could, but if it was there, you I could, could avoid it. <laughs> you could, but but you could be streaming it. You know, the, I could be streaming it. Yes, and, um, I, and I usually don't. Right. Yeah. So so there's a, a certain selectiveness about where you're, you're you're going in the direction of your curiosities and you're avoiding things that you think might be unpleasant. Well, it, to use Russell's term. Oh, there you go. It, it's it. <laughs> That, that, that brings up an interesting thought, though. So thinking in that musical curation, right, it's leading me down certain paths, but not other paths, right? Because of that avoidance thing. But then well, it's it like gets, being it, on a bowling alley, right? I mean, there's there's bumpers on either side. But but does it uh, kind of um, you know make that narrower by definition? In other words, and so are there other things because of information avoidance, do we get a narrower scope because we're not opening up those blinders to seeing various different, you know, potentially unpleasant things that might open up our, our mind again, thinking through business, um, looking at the, you know, negative feedback from from something that you have going on, it could open up an idea to a whole different we might, instead of behavioral grooves, we might be doing, you know, um, behavioral jumping or something. I don't know. That was, uh, not, but there are other <laughs> okay. ways, you know, but looking at something from a different perspective. Oh, gotcha. Okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. So. Okay. How about you? How do you find new information I, or music? I get a lot of uh, emails and, te- you know, I'm, I'm kind of in the music community, so I'm talking to people a lot. And and I anybody I, younger than like fifty five? Yes, God, I, yes. I listen to I, I I get to play with a lot. Actually, I you know share nights, you know, and I go out and you know play a double bill. And a lot of those artists are are under thirty. And oh. yeah, how about that? <laughs> and uh, God, and so um, so in the conversation, so. I, you know, I'm curating to some degree. I'm curating my playlist based on r- referrals from people that I trust. Mm. You know, so I'm I'm being informed by what would be interesting because if they say, "Hey, have have you you know checked out this this new record by the by the um, Cactus Blossoms?" Like, no, I haven't checked that out. Or the Pines? Oh, I haven't checked that one out. Okay, so I'll ch- so that leads me to because it's coming from a. Um, a trusted source. Trusted source. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. That's fascinating. Yeah. I never knew you actually listened to stuff <laughs> that was beyond you know 
I'm joking. I know you do very much. You're very musically inclined across all genres and eras. All right. Um, oh shit. Excuse me. Oh. <laughs> Listeners, thanks for hanging in with us for another uh, another session, and I hope you enjoyed this uh, this romp through Carnegie Mellon. There is more to go, and we hope you check out the entire series. And please leave us a rating, uh, favorable or unfavorable. We swear we will actually even read any unfavorable reviews out there. But, you know. We won't avoid them. We won't avoid them. But thank you. 